everyone to our uh, midweek Bible study at the Center Reach Bible Church. And uh, we're going to get right to everything tonight because we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to discuss. And uh, if you first want to say hi to everyone, uh, those who are here, those who are listening on Facebook and uh, we're uh, on YouTube also. Uh, if you have a YouTube account, go there and go to St. Reach Bible Church and you can subscribe and uh, keep up with all the things that we are putting out in these times and uh, say hi to my Riverhead Raceway friends. I say hi to my uh, uh, Long Island Off-Road friends who might be listening and everyone across the country and out of the country who follows us, we thank you. And uh, we're going to get right to it tonight. And uh, let's just start by bowing our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, uh, to just delve into areas that uh, most people don't think that God-fearing people ever delve into. Uh, but we're not afraid, Father, because we know, we know science, Father, uh, and, and its origins better than most, Father. So as we look at science, Lord, good science, true science, and we look at your word, and we look at all these examples, Father, let tonight, through thy Holy Spirit's power, open up closed minds and closed hearts, and those who are maybe given God a second thought these days. Uh, let this not be uh, placed upon deaf ears tonight. Give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxy. In Jesus' name, in power we pray. Amen. 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 So tonight, this is part five of a uh, study that we've been doing in space, matter, time, and the Creator. Uh, how does uh, God's Word and science, uh, do they coexist? Can they coexist together? And I would uh, suggest that you uh, go to our YouTube page and you listen to the introduction to the study, part one, part two, part three, part four, and uh, tonight, part five, as we continue on. But before we move on, uh, I want to give you guys a list of what's coming up. Uh, so you're always excited about, you know what, uh, God is not boring, church is not boring. Uh, if people make it boring, that's up to them, because there are so many exciting things uh, to talk about. Next week, UFOs, life on other planets, are they real? Alien accounts of close encounters of the first, second, third, and fourth kind. Can we be 100% sure uh, there is life or there is not life out there. And what of all the uh, accounts? Uh, are all of them fake or some of them real? We're going to go delving into that, one of my other favorite topics. And uh, actually, it was through that that, you know, searching for those things in such areas uh, uh, that down the line I ended up here. Uh, so it'll be exciting. Then after that, a promise that I have forgotten to keep, and that is how to share your faith and not look like a kook, okay? We're going to do that with some interaction. We're going to let you guys uh, ask questions, try to stump each other. Well, try to stump me and challenge me, not that I am the grand poobah of, uh, of this or anything, of apologetics, as they call it. Uh, but we will do that, and um, maybe you know there are things I have to learn in sharing. But I, I, I've learned a lot in sharing and uh, how to do it and how not to do it. So we're going to do that. But getting right to it tonight, because I hope we can get this all in. There's a lot to talk about, and I do have a short clip that I want to play at the end. Uh, but tonight, very, very important, evolution, fact of Truth or the greatest fiction ever told, okay? Uh, is it something that's been concocted by man or is it based in real scientific study and uh, application? And then, like I said, time permitting, uh, as we talk tonight about 
We've got to ask the question. What, tonight, you're going to know, thousand percent, evolution, truth or lie, okay? There'll be no doubt, I promise it, thousand percent, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to prove it to you, okay? I'll prove it to any scientist, I'll prove it to anybody. And we're going to do it here tonight with a couple of things I have on my little table of tricks, okay? It's so easy to do, people. Now, when we get to that point, and if we can prove that evolution is a lie and totally fabricated, we're going to ask the bigger question, why? Why teach and push something as a truth that isn't a truth? Why push something that tells us where we come from if it's not where we come from? Because people, at the end of the day, understand what is the theory of evolution. It is an attempt to declare to the world where we come from, where everything you see comes from. Okay? But before we get to that, uh, I want to add this. Uh, if you have any topics that you'd like me to cover, okay, in the weeks coming up, in the months coming up, questions about the Bible, about science, about anything that you always wanted to know, please link on uh, Facebook. You can, uh, uh, you can put it there. You can email me at pastorscottcbc at gmail.com. Pastorscott, S-C-O-T-T, C-B-C, gmail.com, or you can text us at 631-769-6712 anonymously and give us an idea. Say, you know what, I've always wanted to know this. And we will put those topics through the filter and see what we come up with. Anyway, let's get back and let's recap where we've been over the last four or five weeks. The questions we asked and the answers we have gotten so far. So of time, did it have an access or a beginning? Yep, we found out time had a catalyst. Time had an origin. Matter, uh, was it something that always was? Was it eternal or did it have a creator? We found out it did. Matter had an origin. It is not eternal. We spoke of space-time continuum. Uh, the space-time continuum. Is it spoken of in the Word of God, in the Bible? We found out, yes, it is. Matter of fact, the Creator clearly explains the need for a tri-universe and the details of its components that make up a space-matter-time continuum. Then we spoke, and uh, if you guys were here for the mighty flagellum, okay, we had a lot of problems with all the videos and stuff. It was a little bit chaotic that night, but we did get the flagellum out there. And did it uh, do what it was supposed to do? I think it did. I think the mighty flagellum ends the debate once and for all. But we're still going to go on with this question. But before we move on, as I say and I've said for the last five weeks, why? Why do this type of study? So I do me a favor, just lower my mic just to hear. I get a little bit of feedback. Why would a church, little country house, little house on the prayer, we church, we call it, you know, we don't got bells, we don't got whistles, uh, we don't have high, well, we have a little bit of tech now, we got low tech, but we got some tech, but, you know, why not just stick with just, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why go into all these bizarre things? Well, as I've said each week, I think that's good. I think that's good. Did you lower it a little bit? Okay, that's good. You know what? Though we come to God through faith, we still have to li live in Reelsville. Right, people? We live in Reelsville. And sometimes the world, sometimes the world accuses us of living in fantasy land. But you know what? We don't live in fantasy land. I live in Reels world. And what does that mean? It means, you know what? Sometimes I have to deal with things in the present. Okay? There are things right in front of me that are happening and they can be scary. 
There is sickness. There is bad news. There is the evil of the world. And there is political unrest. And there is that helpless feeling that more and more people, I would say since last week, I think more people feel this way this week. And I think next week you will feel even more this way. The helpless feeling that we are all alone and the wicked are coming for us and no one cares. And it's because of those fears we then need to understand these facts. That the Creator is not a fairy tale. That the Creator is not wishful thinking. That the Creator is not something made up by man. Religion is. Religion is the opium of the people because it's made up by man, but not the Creator. And what does this all mean? It means that if there be one Creator, and there is, well, then He is brilliant. He is powerful. He is over all. He is bigger than all. And He is technically able to save the day. Because if He's not able to save the day, then what good is He? He needs to be able to deal with the wrongs, to punish the evil, and yet still be able to hear me when I cry and I stub my toe. That's the kind of creator you would expect in a very orderly, intelligent cosmos, and that's what we see. So that is why we must see the creator as he is, eternal, never-ending, supernatural, above the natural. And in control. If the Creator is not in control, then how can you be the Creator? You've got to be in control. And the best way to show you that He is in control of the United States, of Russia, of Pakistan, of India, of Iran, of Iraq, of every cell in your body, of every star in the cosmos. He is in control of the planet. He is in control of death. He is in control of COVID. He is in control of cancer. Well, in order to understand that, we first need to see that he is in control of creation. Because if he's not, then how can he be in control of anything? And not only in control of it, but the maker of it. Which brings us back to this question. If we are simply a random chance accident, then there is no purpose for suffering, there is no hope for our suffering, and there is no sure way that we're going to get out of 2021 alive. Because if it's us alone, do you know what that means in the Greek? It's us alone. That's what it means. <laughs> There's no one coming to save the day. Which brings us back to evolution. People, you have no idea how important this is and the forces that are behind it. This is not just some side thing. This is a very pivotal point of everything. And I'm going to prove to you tonight the diabolical side of it and what the result of it is. So tonight, I'm going to give you some facts about evolution that you must consider. Number one, it is called a theory. It is called the theory of evolution of how we came into existence, yet it's taught as a fact. Why? Number two, there is not one single shred of evidence of macro evolution and that it is real yet it is taught as fact why number three if it's truly a theory well then what's the backup theory well according to some scientists there is none it's either that or nothing and you see that's why it's bad science and I've told you before, and I'm going to give you this example. Okay? Let's say there is a murder. And there are two suspects in the murder. But you are detective, and the police captain, whatever, he tells the detective, listen, I want you to investigate this murder. Find out who 
did it. There were two possibilities, but you can't look at person one. Just forget about that. You have to prove that person two did it. And the detective said, well, why can't I even consider person one? Well, that's the boss's son. So don't even consider him. You see, with evolution, they have no other alternative. There is no backup plan. It is this or nothing. Why? Why? If true science is always looking at all of the facts, let's get all the cards on the table, all of the possibilities. Why can't we look at all that? No, we're only allowed to look at one. And you must accept it. Number four, if ever, excuse me, for evolution to work, it has one major anchor that the evolutionists hold everything dear on. Okay? Without this one component of evolution, everything falls. And what's so unbelievable is it's the silliest thing you can ever imagine. But evolution, and for it to work, it hangs on one thing, and one thing alone. Time. They need time. Because they believe bad scientists, because I'm not, you know, there are good scientists and there are bad scientists. A foolish scientist believes that anything is possible if given enough time. And you know what they say? I hope so, because I don't know how else to explain it. It better be that if we leave something alone long enough, it will based on the magical premise of time, turn into something it was not before, and even more, something better. Well, in my little finite mind, I know that if I take an apple pie and I put it out on the back lawn of the church and I leave it there for a, a, a length of time, it doesn't turn into a steak. No, it will start to rot away and turn into nothing. Given enough time, it will disappear. Okay? That's logical. But their smoking gun is time. That's why they always... There's billions. There's billions of years. Billions of years. That's, that's got to be billions of years. That's why they believe in a very old cosmos. But people, the cosmos isn't that old. They're talking billions of years. You know what true science is saying? Maybe thousands of years. That's a big difference. Why do they laugh? Because they need billions. We've got to have the years for things to turn into what we see today. Number five of evolution, the main premise that millions or billions of years ago there was nothing. There was no matter, there was no intelligence, there was no purpose, there was no reason, there was no space, there was no life, there was no nothing. Yet for no reason there was an explosion of nothing that blew up nothing, that created everything all by random chance and chaos, which created simple microscopic life forms, which we learned when we looked at the flagellum, aren't so simple, which over time began to morph into bigger complex cell life forms, which brings us all the way up, here we are today, mankind, and all of our sophistication, male and female, the animal kingdom, aquatic kingdom, organic kingdom, plants, animals, bugs, everything, it all started from nothing and just, just like a manifold went off in all different directions with all complex life forms. <clears throat> 
And on top of that, in time, they all began to work and thrive in perfect order, getting better and smarter every millions of years that run by. Do you think, do you think things are getting better and smarter with every year that goes by? Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, actual science you know, knows about decay. They understand that things don't get better, things decay. Like the apple pie. Well, that's just so simple. You're, you're not a scientific mind. No, I'm a logical mind. And I know an apple pie left outside is not going to turn into a steak. That's logical. It is the natural order of decay. Yet, for some reason, in this one particular case, all the other laws of science were put on the side and allowed to do things apart from the laws of science for evolution. It's a special thing. It doesn't have to obey the normal laws of science. And what does this all mean? that we are all the result of a massive mistake. We have no purpose. We are not designed for anything but just a random accident. And that there is no intelligence behind it at all other than the intelligence of some scientists who think their minds are very big. That there is no reason for anything that nothing has been before us and nothing will be after us. Okay? When you die, you just worm food. And before you were born, there was nothing to worry about anyway. And that a worm and a human, and now this is going to, you have to under, understand how these things all dovetail together. How you see the diabolical component here. Because the premise is, I don't know if you watched the two weeks ago when we showed that clip of that uh, physicist who said that we're, or even humans, we're really birds, that we haven't evolved past. Uh, and, they, and these are teaching in our universities. And what do they say? Well, in reality, and I'm, I'm just pulling an example, that a worm, you know, your little earthworms that come out in the summertime, and a human, we're all equal in importance. One is not worth more than the other. Which is why, now people, follow, follow the tracks, okay? Follow the tracks. The people who believe in evolution, do you know what the natural fallout for them is? Well, to them, abortion means nothing because life means nothing. Pedophilia means nothing because there are no laws. There is no moral compass. Euthanasia means nothing. Kill someone. People, you know, there's that, this is happening all over. Old people, ah, we don't really need them anymore. Get rid of them. Who cares? Retarded people, pull the plug. What's the point? They have no purpose. They have no reason to exist. We're just worms. We're, 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 we have no significance. And that's why to them, morals mean nothing. And evolutionists will be amoralist. No morals. Because how can there be morals if there is no one to set the standard? And of laws, laws will mean nothing to the one who follows evolution. Because there are no laws but the laws of science. And what's the laws of science? Right? Survival of the fittest. You know, they teach that as their main thrust, yet when somebody comes over to them and shoots their wife and you say, well, she should have survived. If she wanted to continue, she should have fought for herself. I had the gun, she didn't, she's dead. Well, that's, that's, your, that's your philosophy. And who's ever smarter will live longer. Well, that's a big problem, people, because... It is not us who are living by blind faith. It is them. Mm -hmm. They're walking by blind faith and they accuse us of blind faith. I'm going to give you some examples tonight of why evolution 
is completely impossible, implausible on a thousand levels. But first, a little tidbit. If you come across an evolutionist, and maybe there's one who's listening tonight, and you know, I don't, and I probably do come off with a little bit of malice or arrogancy. I shouldn't, and I apologize for that. But the reason why I get worked up, because the consequences are serious. This is not a, just a discussion in science. This is a discussion of the, of the future of humanity, of what's happening to everything. Because if a child is taught in school, and they are, that you're just, you know, a little bit better than a worm, little Johnny, and when you die, little Johnny, you're going to be worm food. What does that tell? Well, what would a generation be like if that's what they were told? Well, I have no purpose. If I live or die, I have no significance. Suicide means nothing because who cares if I live or die? I, I, I have, there is no plan for me. I am completely alone. It's just me and a drawer of the cards. And, and if it's survival of the fittest, well, then the bullies will rule the world. That's a pretty big problem. And that's why I get passionate about it. But when we're talking to evolutionists, and they say, you know, I had a, a couple of years ago, I had, I don't know, this is one of those divine appointments. I had a, a couple of young guys come in here. I said, it was during the day, during the week, and they had to use the bathroom. And uh, they said they were walking home from Suffolk Community College. And uh, uh, they wanted to play, okay? What I mean is they wanted to play with me. And so they kind of, there was two of them, and they were kind of this... Uh, you know, so what's this whole uh, God thing here, you know? And they wanted to set me up. So I, you know, I played along, and uh, so I said, so well, you guys, oh, yeah, we're taking, uh, so you taking science class or something? Great, tell me what you know, and, and everything. And when they say, so you believe in evolution? You know what the answer always has to be? A question to them. Well, what are you, uh, what are you talking about, macro or micro evolution? Okay, of course, they don't know how to answer that. And right away, you show them that you know what you're talking about. Because I will tell you something about evolution. There is such a thing as microevolution. Okay? And what we are talking against is macroevolution. So, you know what? The Word of God tells us, you know what, to study yourself to be approved. Okay? a workman that rightly knows how to divide the word of truth. And what have we learned in the word of God? There is quantum science in there. And we spend too much time talking about things that to the world are silly. Well, you want to talk science? We'll talk science. We'll go head to head with you. Your science against real science. If evolution is a lie, I want to ask you this question, and we're going to keep going back to this. What is the alternative? Okay, And we're going to end with that answer. But I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. So when you talk to people, ask them, is it, is it a fact of, of evolution? Is it a theory? Oh, no, it's a theory. Okay, well, what's the other theory? Because if it's a theory, that means... It's not provable. It's not, uh, you know, uh, repeatable. It's not visible. And you might have a, you know, a problem uh, proving it. But they'll say, no, 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 it's, no, it, it is. But, well, then why call it a theory? And if you call it a theory, what's the other theories? <laughs> Do you have any other theories? They won't know what the answer because they're told a theory is a fact. But only in this case. Everywhere else, a theory is a theory. What's a theory? A theory is, well, we think this is what happened. Okay, I have a theory about the murder. You know, I watch a lot of Colombo. You know, there's a lot of theories. You know, you have person A, B, or C who could have killed the person. Those are my theories. I have to weigh the evidence and find out the truth. 
You see, you know, one of the reasons why it has to be evolution for them, because the only alternative is an intelligent designer, a programmer. And they don't want that. They don't want that. But let's talk about this micro versus macro evolution. Micro evolution is real, and I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. But I'm going to give you a really simplified thing. Micro evolution is a city rat versus a country rat. Okay? You could even say a city cat versus a country cat. Well, what's microevolution? Well, through pro pro excuse me, programmed intelligence, and you know what? I have animals, I've had dogs, I've had cats, I have cats now. They know a lot of things. Okay? They have programmed information in them to survive. They know things. And what is microevolution? Well, a cat that's, that's raised wild in the country can survive in the country. You take that cat or rat and you put them in Manhattan, they're going to die. They're not going to know about cars. They're not going to know about any of those things, how to get food. But a cat who is born and raised in Manhattan will survive in Manhattan. Why? Because of microevolution, which is the ability to adapt to an environment you're placed into. And we could even go with that and say, well, how do they know to adapt? How does a cat know to adapt to, to trains and taxis and people? How do they know if they walk out here, they're going to get ran over? Because they have some intelligence that's going to keep them. If they had no intelligence, they would be dead immediately. But they're programmed intelligence. You know, I, I just learned that cats, you know, my cats, their whiskers are always, they grow as long as the rest of the body. Why? So when they walk through things, they're sensors so the rest of the body can fit through it. Well, how does that happen? I'll give you an example. Because understand, a, a creature that is designed for a certain environment will thrive in that environment, as opposed to one who isn't designed. I'll give you some real great science here. A fish does great in water. <laughs> they don't do good on the land. Dogs don't live well in the water. But they do do good on the land. So what happens? Well, dogs learn to stay out of the water, and the fishes learn to stay in the water. And the fishes live, and the dogs live. I haven't seen too many fishes jumping out, trying to walk up on the beach. They usually end up rotting there. Okay? But what of macroevolution? Okay? What of macroevolution? Well, this is the lie that we need to be concerned about. Because what they believed is that a cell, back billions of years ago, you know, and you know, they had this, so many different, you know, you have the Big Bang, and then you have this thing that there was this time when there just happened to be this primordial soup of enzymes and electricity and lightning shot it, and it started to be a cell. And then from that cell that breathed in a fluid, it came out of the fluid and developed lungs. And you would think the minute that thing came out of the fluid and took its first breath, it would die. How would it even have time to advance lungs big enough for it to live? Even a minute. A fish can't live a second. To me, how do you go fishing? How long does a fish last when you take it out of the water? Well, maybe if I leave it there, he'll adapt, and he'll start to grow, you know, lungs. And then they believe that this breathing new organism that came upon the land would evolve and have better breathing apparatuses, would become more advanced, 
would eventually turn into a bird and a monkey. You know, you know that whole picture they got at the Museum of Natural History. And then the human. And you know what? How many schools go there on school trips to the Museum of Natural History? And they don't say, well, this is a possibility. And the, you know, the belief in an intelligent design who made everything is a possibility. No, this is it. Fish, tadpole, monkey, here we are. <laughs> you see all the things. There you go, little Johnny. And what is macroevolution? If you watched that clip a couple of weeks back as Ray Comfort stumped all those biophysicists and these great minds, but they probably all lost their jobs after those interviews. Because they're all so pious. And I feel bad for them because they know nothing else. And what's even more frightening is if they even did, did think about maybe there is something they are left out of the scientific community. And they lose their funding. And they lose their jobs. You want a great movie on the facts of that. Uh, it's a movie that Ben Stein put out. Uh, oh, John, what was the name of that movie again? I remember? Uh, Expelled. Expelled. Uh, I showed it here once in church. Now, Ben Stein, he's not a Christian, he's a Jew, but you know, he goes and he investigates. Every time a scientist said, you know what, I don't know about this. I, it looks like this thing was designed. You're out, you're mocked, blacklisted, no one's going to give you funding. You have to secretly sit with other people. And boy, Ben Stein, would, he met with a couple of well-renowned atheists. And he would just, he'd be able to hear it, see Ben Stein's kind of a funny, simple guy. Okay, but what came before that? But what came before that? But what came before that? He always just, he kept pushing them in a hole. And there's a great uh, clip in there where uh, I think it was uh, Hawking. Uh, uh, yeah, Hawking. What's his first name? Um, I not the one in the wheelchair that passed away. Because there's Hawking's and other guy, not Hawking's. Oh, okay. I forgot his name. Richard something. Lawson. Lawson, maybe it is. Anyway, he's, he's, he's the big renowned yeah. head atheist today. And, you know, and Ben Stein would just talk to him in a corner and say, well, okay, well, where did the enzymes come from? And where did the crystals come from? And, and well, well, they probably came from another planet. Well, then, how did they get here? Well, they probably, you know, just from the explosion. Well, from that planet, what happened? And then he actually backed him into the corner. Well, maybe there was some, you know, life form that created, oh, God, no, no, not God. Not a God. Just some intelligence, and I, I can't even believe he even said it. But if you back them into a corner, and just keep saying, well, where did that come from? Then where did that come from? And, you know, there's a lot of scientists, well, you know, we're going to talk about the aliens, okay? Aliens are the answer to everything. Then. Well, where did they come from? Well, who made them? <coughs> what came before them? Okay. Nothing comes from nothing. Look around. Do you know anything that comes from nothing? Nothing comes from nothing. And macroevolution, people, it's the idea that one kind will turn into another kind. See, that's the important thing. Yeah, we can see fish have changed and birds change. But they don't change what they are. Okay, on the Galapagos Islands, okay, the finch there, whatever it was, is still a finch. He might have adapted through microevolution a better beat to survive, but he's still a finch. There are no, you heard of the term missing link? You see, they need a missing link. There are none. What's a missing link? It's a creature that's in between a monkey and a human. Okay? Where is the transfer? Okay? They'll find, but, well, we have these skeletons, and, and how many of these things have been proven fake and false? You know, and did you realize a lot of these things, they build, they find a tooth, and they build a whole skeleton of this thing. They got a little part of a jaw, and that's what we need. We know that's what it is. An example, people, a dog will never evolve into a cat. A cat is never going to evolve into a dog. 
Felines stay felines, and canines stay canines. It will never, ever happen. It never has happened. Anyway, here are some examples to chew on. Real life examples, okay? If you've ever been in my office, I have a collection of crab legs. Okay? Here's my crab leg here. Okay, found it on, uh, uh, what's that road? Uh, Dune Road, out, way out there. Right at the end of Dune Road is that little private, I mean, public beach, I think at the very end where the inland is. And I always walk and I always look for crab legs. And I take them home and I bleach them and I clean them because then they would smell. And, and I save them because to me, they're magnificent examples of a technology that we don't acknowledge as a technology. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I have two things. I have a staple gun. This is Pastor Scott's famous staple gun crab leg <laughs> analogy. Okay? Now, if I walk along the beach and I find a crab leg, I am told, well, over millions and millions of years, the crab, the, the, the crab evolved and, and he was able to design this whole system where if you look here, there's a ball and socket on the top here for this hinge, okay? Looks like in your legs, you got a ball and you got a socket, okay? You need the two to work. This has two ball joints in it, okay? On top of it is a tendon that pulls up, but there's also underneath it a hinge point for a tendon to pull down. In order for the tendon to pull up, the one on the bottom has to release. In order for it to close, the one on the bottom has to tighten, the one on the top has to release. That's pretty involved. And it's designed with little teeth to grab things. And when the crab gives a signal, it doesn't like wait for it to get to the leg, okay? It grabs. And it does what it's designed to do. But when I find this on the beach, the scientists tell me, well, this is evolution. Well, but what if I'm walking along the beach and I find a stapler? <laughs> well, can I, can, I, uh, can I use your same theory? Because I say, you know what, this, wow. Let, let's just say I never saw a stapler. I'm from another world. I come here and I look on the beach and I go, well, it has a hinge point on it. And it looks like something goes in here, and when I squeeze it, a little thing comes out, and it puts two pieces, pieces of paper together. Now, I can say, well, maybe over millions of years, plastic and metal filings blew over the time of history, and it morphed in. Now, you would laugh. That's ridiculous. Obviously, this is made by a paper pro company. Some engineer somewhere made this to do a job, and he designed a hinge point, and he designed a spring to pack up again. But why must I apply one set of rules to this, and not the same set of rules to this? Why? It's inanimate. Okay. Well, it's, it's, no, it's not that it's inanimate. These are both, these, these are real, I can see them, they're not inanimate. Uh, these are things that have a purpose, they were both designed for a purpose, except scientists said this happened by chance. Well, if it happened by chance, that crab wouldn't have lasted very long, because if he didn't design what he needed to grab his prey, he would have died. <laughs> because he can't grab it, get it and put it into his mouth. People, there is a builder because there's a building. There is a staple manufacturing company with engineers because I see a staple gun. I don't have to wonder where this came from. Why do I have to wonder where this came from? You know, I would even ask, you know what, I, I, if I was to tell somebody, I want you to make a crab leg, machine it out, get everything together. Now this crab, this is one of those big crabs, it actually had three other arms on it. It had a whole bunch of joints on it, and they fell apart all the time. So they had many of points went this way. There's actually a ball and socket here where they went this way, and they were able to bend that way as well as do this, and all these tendons were in there. Now, if I told you to machine this, you know, our brother Steve, he was a machinist, you'd probably have to, you know, get blue. You'd have to, like, draw this out 
and really set up, and you'd have to put some time into it. It would take a while to design and manufacture this crab leg. But it's just, it's just a lot of time. That's all there is. Don't worry about it. People, there is a creator. And you know what? We don't even have to go to who that creator is yet. Because you first have to get through the door of, is there a creator? Well, if there's a creation, there's a creator. That's logical. Anything else is insanity. It's insanity. Anything else is pure foolishness. But here is the question. Why? Why sell something that you know deep down is foolishness? And I'm going to prove it to you that every single person knows deep down that it's foolishness. You know why? Because I have scripture to prove it. Why sell something that deep down cannot be proved? It's foolishness. It is unobservable, which you need to have in good science. It is unrepeatable. It is unprovable. It is completely illogical. And by current scientific rules, it won't work. Then why sell it? Because the alternative is there is one bigger than me. People, evolution exists because of pride. If there is someone bigger than me, then I am under that one. And there are rules that will control what I do and don't do. Rules that I must live under. And so, to not be under any set of divine or creative rules, I say there are no rules. Because there is no rule maker. And if there is no rule maker, then I'm free to do whatever I want to do. That is why man wants there to be no creator. So they can do, they can be a law unto themselves. The Bible even says where, you know, where there is no law, there is no infraction. I'm not going to get a ticket for going through the, uh, an intersection if the stop sign is removed. Because where there is no law, there is no law breaking. So what do you do? I'm tired of getting a ticket at that stop sign. I can either obey the law and stop and live or remove the stop sign. Then I'm not guilty of breaking laws. And isn't that what we're seeing today? Take away the police, take away the laws, and I'm guilty of nothing. The crime rate is going down because I removed all the laws. Nothing is illegal. If you make nothing illegal, there will be no infractions. Just, you know, if you don't want to get a uh, ticket going through a red light, let's remove all the red lights. But how would that work? Really, it's really a great little synopsis. It's really a great little theory there. Let's take away all the stop signs, because people hate them. People hate red lights. Let's remove all the traffic lights. How would it be? It's the same insanity. Let's remove the police so we'll have a better society. At the end of the day, man does not want a creator. And so he must invent something, anything, that will explain at least a little bit why we're here. Because the alternative is submitting to authority. People, isn't that the problem we all have? Everyone I know, all of us, we have the problem of submitting to someone who tells us what to do, who is above us. End of the day, we have a problem with that. And if I can get rid of that person who is above me, I can do whatever I want. Now, I haven't read any scripture, but we are going to read scripture, but this is important, because God explains this whole thing. Okay? We're going to go to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. God knew about this whole thing. 
trillions of years ago. He's got us all pegged. He knows the deal. He knows exactly where we're going and what we're doing and why we do what we do. And understand, before Darwin and his theory of evolution, everyone did believe in a creator. Okay? Science, you know, Isaac Newton was a believer, a great believer. He also was a great study of eschatology and end times. And he knew a lot about what was happening in the future. Good science always believed in a creator. Einstein was not an atheist, he was a theist, and I told you that last week, two weeks ago. If you're smart and you're a scientist, you know, you, you call him who you want, but you have to say, there is intelligence behind everything. And then you're faced with the situation, well, what do I do with that intelligence? Well, we're all pointing telescopes out into the skies, spending millions of dollars, Looking for what? Intelligence out there to give us the answers to what's going on down here. Isn't that what we're doing? But if God's there, we're looking around that. Because that's not, we're looking for something else. We're looking for someone who's going to tell us we're great just the way we are. And you just should have a lot of fun and enjoy yourself. And here's the cure for everything. Romans chapter 1. Now I'm going to read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 25 in one version, and then verse 26 through 20, uh, 32 in the King James. And just because it just says it much simpler in a faster way. Romans 1, 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who push the truth away from themselves. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. You know, all of us are born with a consciousness that there is a creator. We all know, deep down, there's something. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. See, people won't be able to stand before the judgment seat of God and say, I never knew if I would have known. God says you have no excuse. Well, I was a scientist. You should have really known. I gave you stars. I mean, you, were a, you were an astronomer. I gave you the stars. You were a physicist. I gave you cells. You didn't see intelligence there. You didn't see me. Then you must be blind or a fool. Well, I didn't want to see you. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, uh, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, and they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. In verse 21, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like, or a God kind of in their own image, so to speak. The result was that their minds became dark and confused. And I love verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people, birds and animals and snakes. So God let them go ahead and do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Verse 25, instead of believing what they knew was the truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. So, they, And here it is. They worshipped the things God made. King James says they worshipped the creature instead of the creator who is to be praised forever. People, now you can hold there for a second. Isn't that what happened? People are worshipping, not God, they're worshipping what he made. And what have we come upon? The, the green world. That... Mother Earth, the planet is our God. She feels, she, yeah, it, it's interesting with all the, uh, you know, crazy weather patterns, you know, what do the scientists come up? Well, the Earth is mad. 
The earth is upset about what we're doing to it. That's your big scientific, you know, yeah, well, we, you know, we polluted it, and now it's, and believe in our people, we don't believe in pollution, and we should take care of what God has given us, but we don't worship it. We worship the one who made it. When I look at a pretty little bird, I don't worship the bird. I say, wow, God, you made a pretty little bird. Thank you for that bird. I see, you know, and there's two, you have two sets of people. You have one person who can go out on the beach and look at out the ocean or up to the mountains or look up at the stars in a telescope and say, wow, look what a big explosion did millions and millions of years ago. Or another person who says, wow, looks like someone made this. Two people. Who is the one walking by blind faith? Who is the one walking by what they see? Verse 26. Now, this is interesting. This is the result when the world says, no God. Nope, nope, there is no God. We will decide how things are going to work. Well, what happens when the moralistic foundations that keep a society alive are taken out of play? Look at verse 26. Now, the King James. For this cause, gave them, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Notice the terms natural. Why did they? Because they didn't know, they wouldn't accept that there was a creator. So there are no rules. There is no right or wrong. And to the world today, there is no right or wrong. Whatever makes you feel good. What, if it, what's that, that saying? If it feels good, do it. Well, that's the philosophy of the world today. Well, what about if I say, well, you know what makes me feel good? You know, abusing little boys. Well, why can't I do that? Because that's how I was born. I, I was born to abuse little boys. How dare you tell me not to do that? You see how dangerous a slippery slope that is, people? Well, how do I know that that's not a good thing because I have a creator who said to do such and such of things? Lusted towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I don't want to know this God because... He makes me face the fact that I am a sinner. I am doing things wrong. And it makes me feel bad. But if I have no authority, then I don't feel bad about doing wrong. Because there is no conscience. There is no guilt. There is... I feel okay about whatever I do. Because of this, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled, so this is our world today because of revolution. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, not even just not believing, but they hate the God that they don't believe exists. Did you ever notice that about atheists? Well, why do you hate him so much? He doesn't exist to you. So why, why is he giving you a hard trouble? Why do you care if I believe in him? If he does not real, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. And I spent the whole night on that, what that really means and how significant that is in our generation. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. What's natural affection? A mother takes care of a child. What's not natural affection? That mother takes that child, throws it in the dumpster. I don't care. Take my grandmother, throw it in the garbage. Kill, I don't care. I got no natural affection. I don't care about you, I don't care about me. Implacable, unmerciful. What, it, it, that explains our society, right, in those verses today. Why we ended up how we are today. And there is no political solution to that. It's a spiritual solution that we're trying to fix with a political band-aid, people. Verse 32, we'll close here. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
for the wages of sin is of death. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 28 says, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But knowing that such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I don't care because it makes me feel good. And at the end of the day, me feeling good is all that matters. And that's taught in the churches. It's taught in the, in the universities. If you feel good, little Bobby or Sue, poking people in the eye with a pin, well, who dare tells you not to? Because you deserve to enjoy what makes you happy. People, it doesn't end that perversion. It goes on and on and on. That is why, to them, they must not be a God. They cannot be a God. So they, what? So we can do whatever we want to do with no fear of breaking the law. That's it. That's why evolution is a lie. And that is why evolution must be. Because there is no, etern there is no alternative for them. It must be. Do we have, are you ready with that clip? I'm going to show, I, I, I know we're a little bit over time, but you got to see this. This is a, a seven-minute clip uh, by Chuck Missler uh, that I told you uh, worked for the uh, missile defense system of the United States. He's a uh, uh, mechanical engineer, brilliant, brilliant man. And I tell you, I'm going to show you a clip that you cannot, you cannot deny the intelligence behind it, and it's going to blow your mind. It'll blow your mind, and you need to decide, because people, I can't make anyone believe in anything. We're all going to be accountable for our actions. We're all going to be accountable for what we do with what we see, because the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament declares his handiwork. You're going to have to answer for what you do with that. Okay, let's show this clip here, and uh, we're in Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-four. God said, "Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind." And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind. And everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, God saw that it was good. Now, a test question. This is a review, in a sense. Why is it that the animals always produce after their own kind? The scripture says so, yes, but why is it operationally so? How are they defined? Is it, what? Very digital. That's the word. Exactly. The DNA is a three out of four digital code. And the implications of it being a digital code is still unappreciated by many biologists, but that makes it definitive. It's digital, not analog. And uh, that's implied in here. We could talk a lot about the animals, but one of the questions that we need to raise is why, after 120 years or more of searching, have there been no missing links? You know, the, the, when Darwin proposed his origin of the species, the, the, there was a lot of optimism that they would ultimately find all the little, the little missing links. They found zero, none of them. And that's because they are indeed, they're digitally defined. Now, there are evidences of design in each species of animal. But in the interest of getting through this session in a reasonable time, I'm just going to take one animal as an example. Okay? A common animal. One that you've all seen. This is going to blow you the giraffe. Mind. How many have seen a giraffe? <laughs> These are interesting creatures. I'm going to, I'm going to use him... This guy is just an exemplar of what you'll find if you look carefully in every something in every animal species, you'll find something unique that required anticipatory design. Now the giraffe grows to be about 19 feet tall. It's the tallest animal that's currently around. Weighs about 2,500 pounds. He can run about 36 miles an hour. He eats about 201 pounds of food per day. He does that spending between 60 and 20 hours eating per day. When does he sleep? He sleeps about 20 minutes a day. That's a giraffe. Interesting character. This guy is an interesting character. He can go without water for months at a time, interestingly enough. And of course, in some of his habitats, he has to. 
But there's some strange things about a giraffe. Being so tall, it takes quite a bit of blood pressure to get up to, to get the blood to his brain. The giraffe's aorta has about 220 millimeters of mercury pressure when he's normally standing. This pressure would be dangerously high in a human. But in a giraffe, it's necessary to get the blood up to up his long neck to his brain. And to accomplish this, he has a heart that's about two and a half feet large, long. In, in, in a huge thing. But he's got a problem when he when he bends down to drink water, he's got two problems, at least. One is that's when he's vulnerable. That's when you would expect a lion to leap out of the underbrush that's been waiting for the opportunity to take it. The other problem he has is that the pressure would normally be enough to burst the blood vessels in his brain because it's designed to be 18 feet in the air. It's now at water level, and it would, he would have a, what would, a diver would call embolism. Right? Well, so what, what's the answer here? Well, it turns out that the valve, there are valves in the artery going up to his, his head that, are, that adjust. When he goes down, those valves close. The blood between the last valve and the brain goes into a sponge. It's diverted around the brain into a sponge-like group of vessels underneath the brain that, uh, uh, that's called the retin rebella, whatever that means. It's, a, it's a, uh, an organ specifically designed to absorb that pressure and to act as a, a reservoir. As he raises his, when, he, when he's down there drinking, if he was to suddenly raise his head, without, he wouldn't have, he, he had just the opposite problem, he had no blood in his brain, and he'd have a dizzy spell, he'd pass out, whatever. But because the, this sponge-like reservoir is there to feed oxygenated, uh, oxygenated blood to his brain when, as he comes up, the veins coming down from his head also have valves that are designed to equalize the pressure. So as, he, as his head goes from 18 feet in the ground into the water, it's sealed off, but as he comes up, the, there's a reservoir underneath the brain in the sponge-like organ, and uh, it's all, the point is it's all been designed in anticipation of his lifestyle. Now what makes this particularly useful as an example, I want you to imagine how this evolved. Because the deficiencies in his design are fatal. And you've got to remember one thing about evolution. Dead animals don't evolve. Okay. So if he has a blood hemorrhage and dies, there's no way to pass on that experience, however you want to fancy, you know, fancifully imagine it, to his offspring. Whether it's because he, he, brought, it, because he brought his head down and had an embolism, or because not, somehow he got equalized, maybe getting his head up, he would pass out when the lion's about to eat him. So, and if the lion eats him, of course, that leaves a very, very difficult fossil for, anyway, you get the idea. Okay. So, what's interesting is you can find hundreds of examples where there is an essential design element, either in their skeleton or their circulation system or whatever, that is essential for their survival. And trying to conjure up out of one's imagination an evolutionary hypothesis of how it got there is an errand, it's a fool's errand. Because the defects, especially in the interim phases, are deficient, and he dies. And, uh, and the survival of the fittest motif, motif makes sure that the interim stages are gone. You follow me? So, and the, 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 anyway, they, so you got, you got special design of the heart, special design of the arteries going up, special design of the special sponge-like organism underneath the brain, and a special design of the veins coming down. Very, very skillful design. And what's the greatest insult you can give the designer? To assume it wasn't necessary, all happened randomly. Right? Let's move on a little bit. I, I, don't want, I don't want to spend a lot of time on animals because we've got a much more important topic that will interest us, interest us more centrally than me. Pretty impressive. Huh? And if you think about that, why did God make a giraffe? So we can say, wow, that is intelligently designed. There's no doubt about it, people. It's, it's completely refuted ten times over. 
yet we still have it as the main thrust of all scientific law today, based on a lie, simply because they don't want to be a god above mankind. It's been the problem since the garden, and that's our problem today. And you know what? As we close out tonight, tonight the solution has always been the same. God says, just admit that you're wrong. I forgive you. Okay, that's the lesson why he has forgiveness. I am here. Wait, I've been waving your whole life. I'm over here. Look at the giraffe. Amazing. If you're a scientist, you should find that fascinating. You should want to know. And I never even thought of that. How does, it, how does the blood pressure go up down? Then it has to stop and it goes down there. Okay? It's fascinating. These things are... The Bible says the firmament and God's creation declares his glory, so we're, we are without an excuse. No excuse. And then once you determine there is a creator, then you need to know what does that creator want from me? And what's keeping me from that creator? And when we learn that the creator tells us I got a manual, we have a problem. We have a recall. We have a defect that only the manufacturer can fix. Okay? It's the sin defect. And you dearly can't fix it. You've got to go right to the manufacturer. They've got to flash your drive, right? Like they say. <laughs> yeah, with the blood of Jesus Christ. And it fixes the defect in humanity. But you have to wait on your car dealer ain't calling you. Hey, you're going to come in and get that defect fixed? we got recall. You know, he's not going to hound you. And when you crash because your brakes don't work or whatever, well, you didn't get the, you know, you didn't come and get the defect fixed. And God is saying, you didn't come and get the defect fixed. And I often, I sent it to you free of charge. I paid for it with my son's blood. Apply it to you. The recall is done, okay? And you're right with the Creator, and you're going to be okay. Everything will be okay. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, we pray, Father, that people just take these things and just, you know what, just think about it. Just use the logic that God has given us. I know there's a lot of smart people, way smarter than I am. And, uh, let them use that logic and really just, if they're truly seeking truth and wisdom, like I am, then they should want to seek for truth in every area to find out what the real truth, and not to be afraid of what a truth might be, but to accept it, because that would be a fool to not. And you would be, as a scientist, we would be denying the very precepts of what a scientist is. To search, discover, find the facts. And learn from them and be someone better than you were before. To find the facts and deny them is criminal. And the greatest foolishness of mankind. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.